you could have a hundred thousand children at Christmas crying because your li- your wheels collapsed. And I just thought, <laughs> oh no, the guilt really <laughs> got to you. <laughs> children cry. <laughs> Hi everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I am in the Lego Idea House Museum, joined by Lego designer Jamie Berard, and he's going to take us through some of his time at the company here, and his Lego fandom, and then we'll talk about the AFOL Lego community, so I really appreciate you joining me today, Jamie. Happy to finally be here. Congratulations on your many years of success. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's been a fun ride. So if you want to start off by by talking about kind of your Lego fandom as a child, and just maybe a, an overview of your history that kind of brought you to the company. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I've been a Lego fan my whole life, and I still am today. And uh, I was actually, now that it's Christmas coming up, I've talked with my parents and family, and I mentioned how it's only Christmas when I get a Lego set. <laughs> and it's funny for people to buy me a Lego set when I work in the Lego company, but it's just the way I am. Um, but I've been a fan my whole life, yeah. It uh, started when I was a small child. Um, basically, once I found Lego, all other toys seemed to get pushed to the back of the bin. And it kind of grew from there. And then as other people outgrew it, I inherited their Lego. And then I got more and more. And it was only when I was uh, in 1999 at a, at a store purchasing Lego and I saw the Lego fans there. I realized that people were coming together as a group. And I joined uh, Nilug at the time. And then we got to do these great projects where we got to work on some, some bigger commissioned work. And I got to work with other people. So no longer just being alone working on my own, you get to work with other people. And that was great. And then from there, I learned to talk to, uh, to, to build for other people. Um, and something like, uh, I'm trying to think, the Milliard Project that we did up in Manchester, New Hampshire. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah, we actually have a video on the channel of, of oh, walking right. around that and showing yeah, it off. Yeah, so yeah, here, and don't forget to subscribe. <laughs> you uh, <but laughs> you've got it down. Good job. Down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> so, um, no, when we did the Milliard Project, not only did I get to work with Lego fans, uh, my, my friends, and then I also got to meet with Lego people that actually work for the company. So Eric Farsigi and I got to work with uh, uh, all kinds of people. Mm-hmm. And uh, then you actually get to learn about some of the, the ways the company works and you learn about constraints and you learn about actually thinking ahead and ordering for bigger projects and stuff. So it helped me basically as a fan getting better at making my models. And then when I ended up going to, uh, I think it was Brickfest in 2005, uh, I had some large models that I made a Ferris wheel and I made some other things that were robotic moving stuff, Mindstorms. And that's how I got offered the job at Lego. And what's kind of cool is then my hobby became my career. And it's quite a nice and interesting shift where now I can do all my creativity and all my fun at work. And then when I come home, I just like to kind of decompress and almost get spoon fed by the building instructions Lego. But I still build Lego at home. Uh, it just happens that I want to see how somebody else solved the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great story of kind of how you you came to work at the company here. So you mentioned that as a child, you know, Lego kind of became the, the number one toy that you played with. What was it that really stood out to you about Lego versus some of the other options you had as a kid that really yeah. kind of led you into to finding that as the, the number one thing that you enjoyed? I think I'm more, I was always more of like a reality-based kid. And I loved replicating the world around me. And most of the other toys, they were kind of given to you already, whatever it was. And I really liked when we would go on vacation somewhere. We would go to a family uh, trip to an amusement park. I wanted to come home and build the ride that was the big one that I went on. I wanted to try to do something like that. And just having those basic pieces, but also having an ability to do functions. Very early on, I was just captivated by movement and by chain links. I remember my parents brought back chain links and my mind was just blown. I'm like, how is this even possible? These little pieces coming together as long as I want within my budget, which was this long. Um, And then just being able to replace the rubber bands and string and things I was adding to my models with official Lego things. And later on, my mom even joked uh, because I was doing a bungee cord ride where I had a free fall tower. And she says, oh, she says, I can get you some bungee cords. She says, I have sewing stuff I can get for you. I'm like, no, no, no. I need two of these Spider-Man sets (laughs) because they have this bungee cord. She's like, I can give it to you. I'm like, no, it has to be the official Lego bungee cord. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're like, this is very important. You have to understand this. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And she didn't understand it, but then she still got it for me. And then I got my ride and I was happy. But I think it got especially extreme besides the fabrics and things. But when I was doing that same ride, I realized that I needed a dark, needed by the way, a dark blue beam that was only available in a Technic R2-D2 for like $20. And I ended up buying, I think, I don't know, 14 or 15 wow. of those just to be able to get a tower that was this tall because I wanted that one splash of color. And now I had all these extra pieces that I ended up making into a Ferris wheel just because I had 100 of them. <laughs> you start to learn how to use your pieces. Right. 
Hmm. So it sounds like the movement was kind of a big part of a lot of your builds. Was it something you always tried to achieve is getting, you know, rather than just kind of the static build, there's something that really made it pop? And I think that was especially apparent at like fan events or when you go to a train show, actually specific to the train shows, uh, you start to see the public coming in and what do they stop at? What are they drawn to? Because they've got a lot of things to look at. And it's very competitive to get their eye attention. So when you're doing things like amusement park rides or even trains, the kids just totally stop and they just get lost in the universe. And especially something like the amusement park rides, you have that additional offer where you can have some humor. You can have some, you know, funny, you know, sick people getting over in the corner or you, you can just make things come alive where they seem like they're spinning this way. And then you have the pneumatics or something and then it can slowly lift up. And people just like, what is it going to do next? <laughs> you know, they just don't know where it's going. Mm -hmm. And I think that was always a fun challenge to try to think of the next thing like that. That's something we've definitely found with our great ball contraption videos over the years. Is I think mm -hmm. something that's so appealing about that is all of the movement and just looking at every single module and how it all works together. And I, I always regret that I don't spend enough time to see that because you could spend a day and not see all of the movement and all of the mechanisms. And it's just so impressive to see something so simple mm -hmm. and yet so effective sometimes and sometimes so obviously unnecessarily complicated <laughs> but you equally are just mesmerized like how does this work all day every day continuously because I think that was one of the biggest challenges that I had as a fan and if you talk to the local club where I was from I was uh, creating elements even before I came to Lego because I was so bad at doing gearing that I would literally grind down the gears and make new shapes <laughs> that <laughs> that's one way of doing it would prize as very special elements that they knew this would take an entire weekend of a show in order to create this element and then they would almost wait until that Sunday that the show was done and say I want that element now because okay. it had worn away <laughs> That's, that's a good idea there. I like that. Yeah. So, so you mentioned now that the club you were part of is the New England Lug, right? Yes, New England Lego Users okay. Group. And what, what year did you start with that? That was around 1999, I believe. Yeah, so that's impressive. That's quite a number, number of years yeah. ago then that you were kind of involved in the AFOL community, certainly before a lot of the conventions were around and everything. Yeah. So if you can kind of talk about that process and you know, what's it been like kind of watching the community grow over the years? I think we were pretty lucky because we were one of the early lugs that had uh, some type of a connection with the Lego company. So I remember at the time Brad Justice and uh, Jake McKee had act act actively outreached to the fan community. They were basically the Jan Buyer and Kim of today, mm -hmm. but they were the very first starters. Um, and I remember going to some of the early meetings and actually having Jake there and just being in awe <laughs> that you work for Lego. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> and you came to see us. Um, it really made an impact on me. And then we actually got to partner because we were fortunate that we were close to Enfield, so we could drive there. And there were opportunities that we could help with certain things that they were doing or even just visit to see some things that they were working on. Um, so I think there was something very special about the club that I happened to be connected with. And I think that uh, even to this day, I have strong connections with some of the model builders in Enfield because the ones that I actually came in as a fan still work there. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, obviously where that lug is located is so close to the Lego headquarters there in the U.S. that that's kind of a nice opportunity that most other lugs wouldn't have. And that's like something like the Milliard Project especially was extremely uh, valuable because we were so local we could go, uh, we're basically in the middle point between Enfield and, and Manchester, New Hampshire. And so uh, to work on that over the course of I think it was three or four years that we were working on that on the weekends and stuff, sometimes in Enfield, sometimes in Manchester, um, it was just so much fun. Uh, to have all of these challenges of making such a big display, doing the research, having to take photos of the actual buildings or go through the archives, put in the brick orders, try to think of how can you mass produce or make a building with, mm -hmm. you know, 500 windows. <laughs> you know, what's that treatment that you're going to make for the window that can be replicated that actually looks like the real building? Uh, just so many fun projects to work on. Mm -hmm. So during your time as an AFOL then, what are some of the, the builds that you did that kind of stand out to you as some of your favorites or things that you really enjoyed working on? Um, the the Milliard Project was a good group one. We also did a big MasterCard uh, for a promotion. We did a Lenny Zakem Bridge, which is a Boston bridge. Okay. Uh, we did a replica of that for the New England Home Show. But some of my private uh, creations tended to almost always be amusement park rides. So a giant Ferris wheel, uh, free fall tower ride, uh, mixers, spinners. Um, yeah, the roller coaster was the one that always eluded me. Uh, <laughs> but that's why when I finally came to Lego, I started my mission to get that done uh, because it needed a few elements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then s moving on to your time at Lego, when you first started, uh, what were you, what lines were you working on? How, how did that kind of work as you were getting used to the whole system and figuring it all out? 
The fun thing is that I didn't realize when I was hired is that they hired me to work on the Creator 3-in-1 Ferris wheel because they saw my fairground stuff and said, oh, this will be great. He already is doing that type mm-hmm. of thing. But I came in a bit late because of my immigration delays. So um, they were kind of like, oh, great. You know, that was your project. <laughs> so now what? <laughs> so I ended up working on the Fast Flyers jet aircraft, which is a $20 airplane with these uh, wings that you can pull and pull the back so the wings go back and forth. And uh, it was really fun having that first experience where I was sitting down with my model uh, mentor and I built my jet and it had way too many functions and it had a minifigure in the cockpit and all that. And they said, this is great, but now we need to translate it into a, a creator product. And then he explained to me the creator DNA and how we do multiple models with the same bricks, mm-hmm. which means sometimes you have to intentionally make pieces or put pieces in that you know you can use for a B model or something like that. And it was really nice to have somebody that patient that could translate with me what I wanted to do to here's how you can really do it. And oh, by the way, it's for a six or seven year old. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my goodness. And then you start learning about how kids have a hard time at younger ages seeing, you know, left and right in the different wings and things. Um, And also that they want to play with it. Um, So even just something as simple as having that first model and taking it through an approval process where you have these full grown adults taking your airplane and just slamming it on the table again and again and again. And then I'm like, oh, what are you doing, you know? And they're like, oh, I'm a kid. I'm just playing with the model. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, you're supposed to hold it like this and land like that. Gentle. (laughs) And they're like, you're not going to be there to tell me that at Christmas. I'm going to just build it and do what I want. And then, of course, the wheels collapse. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, but, you know, you shouldn't do that. You're like, and he explained to me something. This is uh, one of my model coaches. It's something that I've always kind of remembered where she said, you know, I am one person in a room of 10 people that is building this and I'm the only one that had the problem. But when you think of one person out of 10 and we're selling these to the world, you could have a hundred thousand children at Christmas crying because your, your wheels collapsed. And I just thought, (laughs) Oh no, the guilt really (laughs) got children cry (laughs) a hundred thousand children or whatever. And it just reminded me how, you know, this, this little microcosm that we work in this little bubble of billand Mm -hmm. that we can be in. Um, you have to remember that this does go out there and I'm not there. My phone number is not in the book. And then it just reminds you the impact of every decision that you make that once it's out, it's out. And all you can do is explain, I'm sorry, (laughs) you know, or make the best product possible and hope that people enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So I I think that as a fan, it was a really nice transition to step outside of not only my universe and my world and how I want to interact with it and really get into the mind of either the child or now with the adults for the creator expert stuff really try to get a sense of who is this for and how are they going to enjoy it and and build with it. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like then you got it kind of an early lesson in the collaborative process here at Lego. So then is that something you've been, now that you've been with the company, I think it's 13 years now, uh, is that something you've been able to to kind of mentor new designers now as they come into the company? Yeah, we're actually a very, we're very good. Even though when I came in, there were 80 designers and now there's close to 300. Wow. It's that collaboration that's what makes the products come alive and become great. Um, so even as a fan, when I was doing it and we would get together doing those, those projects on the Lenny's Aiken Bridge or the other things, um, I immediately saw the value of improving the models because, again, like I said before, how you interact with it is not how someone else interacts with it. But also just to get different cultural perspective, having a design team that represents people from around the world coming together and commenting on things. Uh, it's really, really interesting to see how something that's obvious to me is totally lost on somebody else. Um, And then they're just good designers. I think Lego has also been very good at hiring people that complement each other. We create teams that actually aren't all the same type of person. You have someone who's very good at sketching, one person that's good at drawing, one person that's kind of an engineering type, another person that's the extrovert. and, And when you bring all these different people together, they can be quite chaotic, but as a team, they're quite harmonious. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the strengths that we've really benefited from over the years. Mm-hmm. And during, you know, when when you were hired, you were obviously, as you said, in AFOL before you started working at the company. Was that something common for Lego to, to pull from the AFOL community and bring them in as designers? And has that become more common since then? I'm, I'm a bit surprised since I, I, I thought I was special <laughs> when I came in. So full disclosure. You I, are, Jamie. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, oh, this is so cool. I'm at a fan event. That was my job interview. And then they brought me over and I found out they intentionally were trying to bring a Lego fan into the company because they saw some value of trying to grow the adult business. And that made me feel really special. 
Then I get here and I realize I'm surrounded by Lego fans. They just didn't know or they weren't pronouncing themselves as Lego fans. But so many people already in the company are Lego fans. You go to their house and their basements are filled with, you know, big setups with Lego. And it's just interesting because in my mind, it was always as a club, you had to be a Lego fan in the U.S. And many of these people were just doing it on their own. They work for the company. They go home. They build some more. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was interesting. And then even over time, Lego still continued to hire people with a fan background to try to balance those teams and get some new perspectives. And I remember, uh, an interesting story. As soon as I got there, uh, they were asking, so any other, are there any other Lego fans that we can bring in? I just started naming my rock stars, you know, and there's so many. And then I, m I mentioned this guy, Mr. Zumbi. I'm like, oh, he would be amazing if he brought in. They go, Mr. Zumbi, you mean Adam? And I'm like, yeah, why Adam? He's like, yeah, we just hired him. And I'm like, what? I just say things and they magically appear. <laughs> and now Adam is still here. And he's one of, one of the great designers that's worked on so many things. But I think, especially now, if you look at the company, it's a wonderful mix. I mean, really some high caliber talent from the fan community are here. And that really means that there's, there's not so much of a line between what is Lego and what are the fandom, so to speak. I mean, the fans have always been in Lego, but now there's a real strong presence for sure. Mm-hmm. And so the, the reason we're here is because of the AFOL designer program that, that Bricklink is working on and all of the, the builds that designers are looking at there as they decide what will be turned into the, the sets there. So kind of what's your perspective on that, having been such a big part of the, the AFOL program and kind of what, uh, you know, Lego working with Bricklink on that? I think it's super exciting. I mean, I've had the privilege of getting to see some of the finalists and the models that are being created for me are just quintessential fan wonderfulness mm -hmm. <laughs> like there's such a range of things between the the steampunk the humor including some dark humor having some uh simple things like a holiday set but taking it in a very different direction with some darker tones um i i just love the idea that we can actually celebrate the fans without as much of a filter i mean when we make products internally we're always worried about uh, the experience of the consumers and making sure it's for kids and this and that and lots of different levels of things but I do see this benefit of actually celebrating that uh, that gem of creativity, like in its most purest form. This was their vision, and now you get to explore that pure. Mm -hmm. And even when I build official sets at home, I can't help but adjust them along the way. I have my own opinion on things. And I think that's what's great about these is they're almost like uh, sketch models. Internally, we would call them sketch models. It's that first idea that sells you on the dream. It gives you the vision of what it could be. And I'd argue many fans, if they saw images of our first versions of many of our products, they would love the first version even more than the finished product because it sells the dream. And I think that's what's unique about this is you can now get the dream and then make it your own or enjoy it on display the way it is or whatnot. So um, for me, it, it's really unique, unlike anything that we've done before because of the parameters to really try to deliver it as close as we can to the, the, the source. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure as an AFOL, was Bricklink something that you used as a builder and everything as well? Yes, I'm proud to say I've had an account many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> Not so proud on what it means to my bank accounts. <laughs> um, but I actually, um, since I've been in the company, again, I'm more spoon-fed sets. But as a fan, for sure, once I realized I didn't have to buy you know, 15 R2-D2s to make my tower, and then I'm like, oh, really? You can just buy that single element? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really changed my whole world on how I buy things. I still buy multiples of some things. But, um, yeah, it's been an invaluable resource to get. Even sometimes just parts that I saw that were cheap, <laughs> they were somehow, you know, I had to fill out my, my cart in order to get the shipping or whatever the minimum requirement. And then I'm just looking at pieces. I'm thinking specifically of these, like, quarter-round pieces, these bricks that I'd never seen before. But they were discounted on this site. <laughs> and now it started to become a foundation. I started to think of a carousel that I can build around these shapes. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, I never had that Belleville or Scala set that these were in. And now I can get them without knowing exactly where they're from, but then thinking of all new ways of using them. So I think it's a beautiful site to deliver on your creativity, but also to inspire you sometimes to just find that element you didn't even know existed and be able to get it in quantity that you can do something with it. Mm -hmm. For sure. It's definitely a great tool for everyone out there. So you mentioned now that you, you do building at home and everything as well as obviously your job as a designer. So is that balance difficult for you at all? Is to kind of differentiate between, you know, your work and then going home and, uh, you know, that, that balance there, is that something you find difficult or is it just all fun building for you no matter where you're doing it? Yeah. It, my life has always been a Lego life. So I don't know that I turn it on and off mm -hmm. so much. Like I said, even when I go home, I still enjoy building. And when I get Christmas gifts, I still get like Christmas gifts. So the difference 
is maybe a little bit more dramatic now that I, I'm corrupted because I know how we're supposed to build. <laughs> so things that I used to do before and be very proud of coming up with a new way of doing something, I can't help now but think, but can I do that? <laughs> like, is that actually able to be done? And I hope that's something that Lego fans aren't having that extra thought in their head because I, I love the idea of the free creativity and doing what you want. But I can't help but think that everything I'm doing, I'm like, this would be so cool as a product. <laughs> and I ultimately can't help but see things as an opportunity to share as a product with everyone. And in the group that I'm in, we actually can deliver pretty much anything to the adults because it's not for the kids. We can go a little bit one way or another outside of the norm. Uh, so I'm always a little bit conscious of that, that I can't help but build trying to make it like a set. Yeah, that's definitely understandable. So we've got some of your, your products that you've helped work on here. If you want to point out uh, maybe two or three of these and uh, kind of talk about some of the designs that went, went into some of these as examples of what you've done here. Yeah, there's actually, there's only a couple of them here that I specifically worked on, but at least it's the group that I work in. So okay. like the three-in-one group is the area that I came in originally. And it was actually uh, a house, I'm not sure if this is Building Bonanza or something similar to it. Maybe you would know better than I would. But that's that was the, the origination of the idea for the Cafe Corner, which was the first adult model that I did. Um, and it was because when this came out, or at least the, the Building Bonanza, it was such a huge hit with the adults that they said, we got to make more of these. And the community team had all this data about it. Um, so it was kind of cool making the airplane and then making the modular building. But you can see then future modular buildings, which some people would say generation two <laughs> <laughs> buildings. Um, we go to something like the Parisian restaurant. And I'm actually really happy as we're here in the Idea House that they have this one on display because it's one that speaks to me personally uh, quite a bit because unlike other designers where, I don't know if it's going to be on this one, but yeah, you can see on the license plate of this one, it's a nice little wink to Mike. Uh, his name is on the license plate. Okay. Um, and a lot of designers do that where I've always felt a little bit, I don't know, a, a, a little less inclined to add my own personal information into <laughs> the Lego sets. But something like the Parisian restaurant, um, it actually has uh, my family in it in many ways. So you have uh, the chef represents the restaurant. I grew up in a family restaurant where my parents both, my mom was the wait head waitress and my dad was the cook in a family restaurant. Wow. So for the first time when I'm doing this, I had been on a break for two years of doing the modulars. And then I came back and I had all these thoughts of new ways of doing the modular. And I couldn't help but bring my family into it. So there's a proposal in there with my brother and his wife. Uh, we, of course, have the restaurant. You could argue that's the ex-girlfriend upstairs, <laughs> <laughs> horrified in one of the pictures that uh, is getting married. And then even the name, the, the Chez Albert, is a reference to my dad. Um, not the name of our restaurant, but it's a nice little tie-in. Um, it's actually, um, yeah, there's a lot of personal mm -hmm. things there. Then if we go to something like uh, Big Ben, uh, Big Ben is just... One of the more recent ones that I've done, which is a uh, world building. And I think these are always especially fun because they're so grand. And they're just, they're, they're wonderful that these buildings often have quite a few details that are particularly challenging mm -hmm. to crack. So for this one in particular, we were looking at the clock face and then trying to scale off of that clock face. But it was also an opportunity to think of that element in a new way where uh, we, we actually chose to invert it, where most of the other things that we had done in the past for clocks, if you were to use that, the, the dials stick out quite a bit in a weird way. But by inverting it and then actually printing on the back side of it in verse, so all of the colors are printed in opposite order, it allowed us to do something new and something fresh. And for me as a fan, I love doing something that people haven't seen before. And this is one of those instances that I got to do something cool. And I also got to include this, uh, this tool kit part where you get the little tool wheel. Well, now you get a, a tool bag and I know those are particularly useful for people making mechs and stuff like that. And in order to get those clock hands to work just right, I had to include four of those bags, which is why some people are confused when they look at the elements overview. You see all these extra pieces oh. of, you know, drills and <laughs> <laughs> drills and all these things. Um, and it was just to get those, but I also thought it's nice for the fans to be able to get those extra parts mm -hmm. where some other sets you maybe get one bag and now you can get four. Right. So that's fantastic. You're you're obviously keeping the fans in mind as you're designing these and thinking, okay, this is a piece they would enjoy or, or things like that. Yeah. And it, it even is something like, you know, the, the Tower Bridge is probably the famous one where we had 556 of the cheese slopes. <laughs> uh, we also had it even in the green grocer as early as then. The cheese wedge was still new. And I know people sometimes forget about this, but it wasn't available in gray. 
until there was the green grocer. So I made sure to add as many of those in as possible. So that way, when people got it, they got a lot of them. And I think that's the biggest thing for me as a fan that I always appreciate it is if you get one cool element, it's cool. But when you get 10 of them, mm-hmm. you can do something with it. And so I've tried to have that mantra as best as we can, even something like the wheel arches. When, when Mike made this as a new element for the beetle, we wanted to say, is this an element that can actually be used in multiple places or can you get enough of them that you could do something? So he was quite clever in, in being able to add it so that way you get eight of them in that model. And then since then, you can see it's in the bus. And then we also had it in the diner. And we really try to show the versatility of the element and include it in as many places as possible because then it becomes useful. Mm-hmm. Certainly. And you've mentioned now, uh, you know, a few different how the difficult details, especially with some of these you know, real life buildings and all the different architectural details there. So uh, do you do you come up against kind of creative walls when trying to accomplish a certain technique? And, and if that happens to you, what are kind of some of the ways around that or what do you do to kind of overcome those creative problems when you're faced with something that just isn't working for you at the moment? It's it's a great point. It's even something that I think you benefit from as a fan. I've learned over time uh, to to really be to really be sharp about what's the problem, because quite often you'll you'll be building something, and you'll be forcing something that just isn't working. It just seems artificial, and people are commenting on it. It's just not right. And then you're like, oh yeah, but that's because I have the door here, and you have some excuse as to why you made a compromise. And I've learned over time, get rid of the door. Like as soon as you have these compromises that people are, why are you doing that? Mm-hmm. You, you, you very quickly learn to say, we can always come up with another solution. There's no sacred cow, so to speak, that you have to keep. I mean, there are a few, something like the clock face, I could argue, defined the whole scale of that. But if it really became a problem that I couldn't make that clock face work, try a new clock face. And then it opens up the whole building to just come alive and become correct or, or work out. And I think that's been the most liberating thing for me is to have a degree of optimism that you can always find another way. It's just knowing where's the problem, where, where's the real issue. If everybody's talking about it over here, but it's over here that's a problem uh, that they're talking about, it's actually because of this that's causing that. You know, you could spend a lot of time looping on this, but if in the end the core is over here, just get rid of that. You save so much time and then everything else just falls into place. So little, little thing that I've learned over the years, optimism and really try to not just take what people are saying, but know what's linking to it and what's causing that problem. Mm-hmm. Realize that there's kind of more than one way to approach a problem and you know, it might not be whatever the first thing you thought of. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's really interesting. So I really appreciate you taking the time to take us through kind of your career and then some of your builds here. This is really excellent. And I'm, I'm glad you're excited for the AFOL Designer Program. Yes, I know I, there's some excellent builds coming out of there. So it'll be great to see uh, what finally hits the market there. So thank you so much, Jamie. Yeah.